All right, Graham, you have the floor. Please um, okay. let, us, let us know how we get started with the. All right. Here. All right. Yeah. Thanks, everybody. Pleasure to meet all of you. Um, you uh, can everybody hear me? Okay. Yes, sir. Great. Great. Okay. Speak up if you can't, um, or or hit the chat. I can see the chat's coming through. Um, okay. So so just a little bit uh, of context of what we're going through today. Um, uh, like I mentioned, I've been doing wireless internet service providers for a really long time, uh, and um, you know, not necessarily in the um, mesh style that Althea is in, but I think part of what we wanted to do today is is open up and give some some information about some of the things um, kind of around running a wireless network that that you'll probably need to at least be aware of and maybe even do uh, just to keep things running. You know, there, there's this whole industry of of WISPs, wireless internet service providers. A lot of uh, kind of rural or or regional uh, wireless internet service providers that are that are um, competing with incumbents, uh, and you know while Thea isn't exactly the same thing, uh, there's some there's a lot of overlap and things that you'll need to know and things you'll need to do. So some of the things we wanted to run through like budgeting, figuring out um, what it's going to cost to deploy your infrastructure, uh, kind of the take rate, how you're going to figure out how many people you'll probably get loaded up on these on in your network. Um, looking at kind of what tools you'll need, if you need to hire some help, what to look for around there, um, uh, getting customers scheduled, building rollouts and tracking infrastructure builds, managing your inventory, you know, all stuff that are kind of business concerns, um, but things you'll probably need to worry about if you're acting as an organizer, especially if you start to get much traction. Um, so that's kind of the idea. Um, what, what I've done, we've got, uh, we're down to about 80 minutes. Um, so uh, I, there's about eight topics that I listed here. For each topic, I've got just a few minutes of introduction of, of things kind of from my past. And then I'm hoping that um, all of you will reach out, ask questions, ask for clarification, ask for things for your specific situations. I'll answer if I can. Um, I may not have the answer, but I've been doing this enough that I've usually seen a lot of the questions that people ask in the past. So. Um, so that's what, I'm, that's what I'm hoping. We can really make it a dialogue, make sure that I'm answering the right questions that people actually have and not just yammering on up here about things nobody cares about. So um, yeah, that's the idea. All right. Um, so uh, in that spirit, any, any, any questions or thoughts before I get started? Um, nope, not for me. Great, okay. Okay, so uh, the first... Go I just ahead. wanted to you know to B will also be joining us. Hopefully, again, they lost the internet. They don't have oh, the oh, shoot. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> no, so they had what, a, it's, no, not yet. It's like, what, it's 20 yet. days until their back call drop? Yeah, oh, no. about that. So, pretty soon. <laughs> well, yeah. There's a the reason why they wanted that. to start a network there. But, anyways, hopefully, they'll make their way yeah. back in. Yeah. Yep, that's right. That's unfortunate. Okay, well, um, then just to, to jump in and we'll see when they come back on. Um, the, first, uh, the first topic I had is budgeting and um, kind of figuring out what, what your fixed costs might be, uh, what your variable costs might be, and how to, how to understand or at least begin to understand how to budget um, what you might spend on building some infrastructure uh, and expect to get some of that back. So we'll talk a little bit about kind of expected take rate how many customers you can, or you know, partners, or whatever you call them, how many people you can expect to kind of jump on the service, um, and uh, how to um, how to kind of estimate that uh, around your costs. So, um, uh, welcome back. <laughs> We're trying. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, uh, just back. for your benefit. The, the first thing we're talking about here is kind of budgeting and market take rate and some kind of market specifics. So we're, we're going to jump into that. Um, so uh, let's see. So so just to the high level, there, there are some fixed costs that building any kind of infrastructure you, you will are, are going to incur. Uh, you know, to put up an Althea network, you're going to need some wireless equipment you'll have to purchase. Um, and, uh, and then you'll also have some kind of a fixed cost for uh, each new customer that sets gets set up on the network is they're going to need some equipment and uh, either you or they are going to have to pay for that and um, you'll have to kind of figure out what works best in the market but somebody's got to buy that stuff so those are kind of obvious fixed costs uh, 
and then there is the uh, dedicated internet access. So if you are if you are being the um, uh, provider on the on the circuit, you, you'll need some kind of place for for your customers to terminate and actually get on the internet. Uh, so I know there's kind of some creative solutions to getting that situation that we can talk about in here, but usually that ends up being some fixed costs per month that you're paying for dedicated internet access. Um, and, uh, and then, you know, ideally passing on to share with everybody on the network. So that, you know, I got an echo. Oh, there we go. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay, so um, just giving some really high-level numbers for for what I've kind of seen on those in the past. Uh, usually, when um, uh, well, so with the fixed costs first. Uh, yeah, um, so uh, I, I don't know all of your areas really well, so so um, we may have to dig into each of your areas a little bit. But usually, what happens is when somebody goes out to get started, they pick a neighborhood, they throw up a tower, and they try to put up a tower that's going to be able to provide coverage to maybe something like 30 to 60 people. That tends to be the way that people jump in and get started. So, um, you know, assuming that's similar to how all of you are starting, what usually happens is that particular tower might require infrastructure equipment costs of somewhere around um, uh, three to $5,000. Um, and then uh, you're also going to be looking at getting some dedicated internet access. Uh, it can vary a lot depending on what you're looking to provide, but usually that's going to be anywhere from maybe $400 a month up to maybe $1,800 a month. So those are about the, the most basic costs that, that most people looking to start a wireless provider are, are going to be stuck with. If I may uh, interrupt, uh, 400 yeah. to how much again? Uh, for um, the... I quoted 400 to 1800. Some of that depends on if you're, if you're, if you're jumping up to a gigabit of service right away, um, and, and and you're not in a really, really rural area where you're gonna have to do a lot of new build to get the service, then 1800 is about the max you should have to pay. Hopefully it's even a little bit less than that. Um, okay. Excuse me. So that's for the data, correct? That's for the data, yeah. Okay, now the equipment, um, three to $5,000 for um, what exactly? So uh, what I'm what I'm kind of including that in that is um, primarily some access points. Uh, if you go with Ubiquity, which a lot of people do, then you'll end up paying about five hundred dollars per access point, including the access point and the antenna. Um, and most of the time, you're going to put four to six of those up on the tower to get full three hundred sixty degrees of coverage. So that's probably the first thing. Then you've got to add in a switch, your Althea equipment, some PoE equipment cabling, uh, you might need some mounts depending on the type of structure you're putting this equipment on. Um, so all in, you're probably around three to five K. Okay. Um, I do have a bill of materials on our Althea forum for the, the gateway um, infrastructure that we put up here. We were able to, you know, shave off some costs and um, the Althea router itself was not all that expensive because um, we repurposed a Adele Optiplex workstation computer basically to be the LPA router. So we were able to get around $2,000 and that's for not, uh, nice. yeah, for um, those ubiquity access points or in this case, which was a prison station sector. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, so that kind of got that all started. If you if you want to go to our forum, uh, forum.althea.net. Uh, is that right, Justin? Uh, I think it... That'll forward. Form.alfiamesh.com is what it'll redirect you to because I haven't rebuilt the form with the new domain. But right. Yeah. So if you look there, there is some um, the kind of some bill of materials there in an Amazon uh, list. You get a kind of an idea about what that could look like. Cool. Yeah. Good question. Uh, so um, moving on from there, the way I like to kind of look at that up front is that those are those are costs that you've got to put up. Uh, no matter what, you're going to end up spending that original cost. And so at that point, the more people you can get using that, um, you know, what you really want to do is figure out how many people can I put up on that infrastructure to and still provide good service uh, and then get as close as you can to that number because uh, you're going to spend that number anyway. And then the more people that are using it, kind of the, the more people get it gets divided up among. So uh, it, it, I kind of look at it as infrastructure that's up in the air 
that you've already paid for and put up and not and you're not using or you're not using to its full capacity is just costing you money or has already cost you money and and you're not getting it back so uh you know if possible you really want to um estimate ahead of time and say you know hey i, I can spend two grand if it's two grand like like deborah says i can spend two grand and i can get 40 50 maybe as many as 100 customers up on that estimate what my you know what what i'm going to be getting back from that and that starts to look better than if you get three people using it um uh, so you know a lot of this kind of uh business background stuff is figuring out how do you how do you make sure that you can really fill up your infrastructure effectively <laughs> um let's see so uh i think next section we'll talk a little bit about take rate and uh how to use that to um to kind of plan your infrastructure but just to finish up this section about costs um cost per install um and maybe deborah can uh input if you've looked at that for you for most for most uh internet providers what i see is the cost per install is somewhere around 150 to 250 dollars um for just the equipment that goes on the customer's rooftop uh including you know a, a cpe radio some cabling a mount of some kind um uh, the Althea router, POE supply, and uh, potentially also including some labor for somebody to go and put that equipment up if you're not doing it yourself. Yeah. So, um, if I don't mind, uh, if you don't mind if I interrupt. Um, Please do. For installation, $150 to $250, um, would that be passed on to the customer? or? Uh, yeah, go ahead. Oh yeah, I was I was gonna say that's up to how you want to run mm -hmm. your your business itself um, or your nonprofit. Um, someone has to pay that cost. It, it is a cost that you have to buy that equipment. So you can, I mean, maybe B, you can talk a little bit about how you're kind of managing that um, that cost. But I think it's very flexible. Um, so we are um, with with the 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 grant from Althea, we were able to um, to cut the price in half for most folks, but. The way we're positioning it is this is the cost of the equipment and um if you've got the money now great we'll take it and get you in, get you installed if you don't we'll break it up into like three or four payments or we'll work around you for low-income people um and we're going to be doing a uh, a low-income program and when we get rolling too to help subsidize that so it really depends on how you just want to run run it like We've met folks that are like, oh, 150 for the equipment and labor down, sign me up. And others that are like, oh, well, you're going to have to work with me. So you're just going to have to read the room. Right. Uh, for example, James's deployment is sort of on the other end of this. Um, you know, it's in uh, it's it's pretty much all like vineyards and houses near vineyards. And uh, he's just going to uh, to build them pretty much up front for the installs. He is using higher quality equipment there, though. Uh, and this is this is sort of what I wanted to touch on is that uh, you know 250 for the install cost uh, in terms of hardware is a little uh, can be either a little high or a little low depending on what on like what sort of network speed you're going for. Um, Deborah's installs can s stay under 200 in materials. You know, by the time you add in labor, it's probably back up there. Um, but uh, you know, it can be done uh, a little bit under that. Um, and at the same time, if you're going for like gigabit service, um, it's going to end up closer to three to five hundred. Um, and that's kind of the way we position it to folks. If you if you feel like you need those speeds, and it's going to cost you a little more up front. Uh, I should note that uh, with the Althea model, and this is sort of what uh, B's network is working with, uh, the users do own their own equipment. Uh, oh, there's James right now. Um, hey. So, hey James. Hi James. Um, so with the uh, with the Althea model, users do own their own equipment, so they aren't paying an install cost uh, mm -hmm. that is like non. Well, I mean, I I suppose it's non-refundable because you have hardware. But the point is that they're purchasing the hardware essentially. It's not like a cost that's just paid to the ISP. So there's a little bit of a different context to it. Uh, hey James, can you hear us? I know you had some AV problems last time. Oh no. 
Uh, well, we'll see how this works out. Anyways, we should probably let Graham get back on track here. <laughs> uh, one no, other that's great. Thing, yeah. oh. One other quick thing I wanted to mention, and think, thank you, Justin. I think those were all really great points, was that also, too, um, the, one of the things about Althea is that people who have Althea internet can have relays, right? So they can purchase a, a few, you know, hundred dollars more equipment and then they can make money or offset the cost of their bill. Um, so that's, a, you know, kind of another thing to think about when you're thinking about equipment costs. There are even uh, firms um, that will rent the rent the equipment to to you as the ISP, and then you can kind of re rent it back to the customer. So in the in the kind of more traditional wireless ISP industry, renting equipment is pretty common. For what it's worth. Cool. Yeah. Uh, any other questions about kind of budgeting? We can come back to some of this stuff later. But anything else popping up before I move on a little bit? Um, I would like to know the, um, for the total cost you said for the beams, um, they're $500 each. About that. Um, okay. And I need four to six of them to have a access point, a complete access point. Yeah. Okay. Um, and the next thing is the router cost. Um, aren't those, uh, $60 just to verify? I, so I think I saw that somewhere. Yeah, we have a couple of supported um, routers uh, that we use for the in the in the customers or subscribers home. Um, you know, we have a kind of a basic one that's around seventy dollars, and we have a, a more premium one that runs about um, between one hundred and two hundred dollars, depending on if you want to refurbish or not. Um, and but then for for your gateway location where you've got the backhaul fiber to, you're going to want to use like a desktop computer um, or Linux server or something a little bit a little bit beefier for that. Um, and right now, what we've been running in Classic and I is just a, a Dell Optiplex uh, um, as the main, um, the main kind of Althea router that just has the Althea software on it. Okay. So uh, at the data center in the cabinet is where the desktop, I guess, would be kept with the, you know, the running the Althea um, on it? Or? If you are getting your backhaul from a data center, then that is correct. If you okay. are just using a business or a home to be your, your point where you bring in the wholesale fiber to, then um, that would be where that would be. It's so wherever is, the backhaul is. Wherever the backhaul is, yeah. I think in your case, okay. you were thinking it would be at a data center with roof access. Got it, okay. Thank you. So, yeah, good um, question. Yeah, for right now. Okay. Um, yeah, I'll move on a little bit, and but please feel free to stop me if, if you have questions or whatever. We can run over this stuff again. So um, the next piece that, that kind of fits in with that is how do you figure out, um, at least try to guess how many customers you're going to be able to get from that tower? Uh, so you know you know what, what you need to invest. How do you know if you can get that investment back? Uh, what I've usually seen for, for wireless internet service providers is a take rate of anywhere from about 5 to 15%. Um, and uh, uh, I've pretty rarely seen it go much over 15%, uh, may, maybe up to 20, but not much higher than that in areas where there is a strong incumbent like Comcast or something. Um, and, uh, uh, but the, the time that it might take you to get to those numbers depends a lot on how much you're willing to spend both time and money in marketing. Uh, you know, I've seen at, at one extreme uh, really um, strong door-to-door -door sales, heavy pressure sales culture companies that are able to sell that 15% inside of a couple of weeks or a few months. Um, or on the other hand, you know, more kind of homegrown, hometown, word of mouth, uh, very little marketing spend type companies who are still able to get up to that 15%, um, but it might take uh, six to 18 months or, or maybe, even, maybe even more depending on the situation. Um, but right around that, you know, somewhere around 10 to 15% is, is pretty normal over, over some amount of time. So, uh, you know, putting those numbers into context, what that means is, uh, you know, if you put up that tower, if you, have a, if you have a tower with six access points on it, you can probably expect to be able to serve somewhere between 75 and 150 uh, customers on that tower before they start to really slow down and, and have service degradation. Um, so, so if you want to be able to fill that tower up all the way, you need to make sure that that tower can uh, see line of sight, have line of sight access to, you know, something like uh, 500 to 1,000 homes. 
Um, and then, you know, you can work on converting 10 to 15 percent of those, 10 to 20 percent of those homes and, and fill up the tower. The only caveat I would put to that is that sometimes what you might see is that your gateway location actually relays to your access point, right? So you might have a gateway location that's in kind of a not not a place that can't see that many homes, um, but you might be able to do a point to point antenna to a place where there's uh, where you can put up that whether that's yeah. a tower or on a hill or whatever that is. Right. That's sort of the right, like right. Althea feature yeah. set is to uh, is 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 to focus a little bit more on relays than towers uh, because that tower that could see a thousand people will cost you three to five thousand dollars a month for two to five years those are pretty pretty normal terms right yeah yeah so um, with Althea uh, you can uh, find an interested community member uh, set up a much smaller tower on their property because they will have an ideal, uh, a, a better vantage point. And this is how uh, Deborah built her network and also why there aren't any sort of competing wireless ISPs in her area that can, uh, that can offer the same speeds Althea does because due to classicanized geography, there's no one tower you can buy that will see 1,000 people or more. So um, she really has to use relays to make her network work. Uh, there's no other right. option, which is why there was nothing until Althea came there. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, sure. And and just to kind of put that in context, what that would mean in the in the model that I just presented is that you wouldn't put six access points at a tower that can't see that many subscribers. You would put them, you know, you would, you would size each relay to the number of subscribers that you might expect to get from it, so that you're not putting money in the air that you'll never use. Yeah, it's sort of a more uh, more smaller towers and sort of a meshier architecture um, with uh, with hopefully uh, a small number of backlinks to provide redundancy rather than one big super important tower that has everything on it. Yeah, yeah, and that um, that tends to create a, a higher capacity network as well, which, which is great as long as you can balance it with the costs. It's going to be hard. <laughs> Um, uh, let's see, uh, um, as far as take, uh, yeah, again, I guess just, just to kind of, the, the, the wireless internet service providers I've seen that end up being successful and sticking around in the long run tend to be the ones that figure out a way to keep, uh, you know, to look, to load up, load the capacity that they build and load the infrastructure that they build. Um, uh, you know, I've seen, I've seen ones overbuild and never be able to sell to cover their infrastructure and they're, you know, they're not able to have longevity in Instagram because they spent too much and, and that, you know, couldn't recoup it. So, um, so, you know, that's, I'm, I'm kind of pushing on that a lot, but, uh, I, I really size, size your build to, to what you expect to get in return. So just to kind of go over like what that would look like logistically, you could, um, you could do something like, you know, get the population of your area and, and go to Google or do a view shed and see what you can see from that particular location and, and, and get an idea of whether you're going to be able to get enough subscribers. That makes sense. Is that kind of what we're talking about? Doing, doing that process of figuring out where what what the population is, how many households there are, going and doing a view shed, and then you know doing some logistics around that link planning. Is that what I'm hearing? Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. That's what I would I would really strongly suggest being really familiar with your market at that level. Uh, you know, being able to understand how many people you're likely to sign up. Deborah actually did a video you... on how exactly to do a view shed, a quick guide, and I'm going to put it in yeah. the description of this video when we post it. Great. Perfect. Yeah. yeah, that's great. Yeah, Google Earth is really a great tool. <laughs> really, it's almost like it was custom built for what we're trying to do. It's really helpful. Right. Yeah, <laughs> so, and sure. it's free. <laughs> yeah, Sorry, Mark, didn't quite catch you. I said that is a plus about Google Earth. It's free. That was coming handy for sure. Can you guys hear me, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, cool. Just making sure. Hey. Graham, I'm curious how much you think the competition affects. Um, I, I know that people are very hesitant to change their um, their current internet service provider, and I'm wondering if you can speak to any tactics that um, might make our marketing more effective to get people that are already on another internet service provider over to a yeah. different one, um, or if that affects the take rate, the amount of, you know, yeah. uh, anyway, I'll let you yeah, speak yeah. to that. Yeah, yeah. Um yeah, you know, every area is a little bit different, but uh, just kind of some high-level guidelines. Uh, there's some percentage of people 
in every market who just really, really hate the incumbent and will jump to you no matter what. You're a new internet service provider and, and they'll jump over and try it just because they hate Comcast so badly. Um, that's probably like one to three percent though. It's not as big as you might expect. But it it's it, it's there are those people in basically every market and, and if you get them and keep them happy, then they can be a good kind of base set of customers who will really evangelize for your product if it works well. Um, uh, so that's really great. Um, uh, in a lot of places, I don't know exactly all the markets you are, you are in, but in a lot of places there really is only one or maybe two existing providers that have much uh, that have much market share. Um, uh, and so, you know, so competing with those is um, is really all you need to do. Uh, like Deborah mentioned, um, switching com switching internet providers is kind of a pain, and uh, a lot of people just aren't going to take the time to do it. And uh, honestly, I think that's why it's so hard for for a small provider to get much more than that 15 to 20 percent take rate, even if their product is in every way better than the incumbent. There's a lot of people who just just aren't going to take the time. Um, uh, so, you know, so it's really hard to reach those people. Uh, there's a kind of interesting thing that happens when there are other wireless options. Uh, one of the difficult things when you're coming in as a new player using wireless equipment is getting people to understand what it is that you're actually doing and what the product is that you're selling. People who aren't very technical don't always understand how the internet gets to their house and you know, don't blame them. I, I wouldn't either <laughs> you know, if I wasn't technical. You know, you just don't really get, you don't really think about it that much. So uh, getting people to just understand that, hey, this is a different thing. It's, it's not cable and it, we're going to put stuff up on your roof and, and all of this can be kind of a hurdle. And... Uh, uh, there are some areas in the U.S. that have a lot of wireless providers, and the the good side of that is that people kind of already understand what this thing is that you're selling, and they can compare it on those terms. The bad side is that they have a bunch of options. So, um, uh, yeah, you know, um, uh, I actually live in an area where there's a lot of wireless providers, um, and and so um, probably overall in the area where I live, at least some parts of it. Uh, more than something more closer to 30 or 40 percent of people have wireless service but it's divided up among eight or ten different companies and so so that's you know kind of hard but any other questions along those lines um i guess i can put in one um uh, well not really a question but yeah i don't yeah i don't really have any questions on that no i'm good no problem Cool. Um, uh, yeah, I guess just to kind of drive that home, it, it's, I think, a really good idea to think through what it is that you're offering and make sure that you as the organizer really understand um, why why people should use your product and understand your own place in the market. Uh, are you are you winning on price? Is your product cheaper? Is it more reliable? All of the above. You know, the things that people really care about in internet service are speed, reliability, and cost. Um, and uh, you know, if you can't win on one of those metrics, then you probably are going to have a hard time winning many customers. Honestly, so um, it'd be better if you can win on two of those metrics. Yeah. Market for the of this product, most um, elderly um, for people who are maybe perhaps um, sixty plus. Um, group, if you're um, in an area where there's uh, the group who use internet, who uses internet, but um, who are completely content with using internet that's less than maybe two, three megabytes per you know, second internet, how would you be able to like kind of like market towards that? Yeah, yeah, good question. So the hard part about that is that it doesn't recoup, reduce your costs that much to sell a lower product. Um, so, so the obvious answer is to say, hey, we'll, we'll, we'll you know, reduce your costs and, and keep your prices really, really low if you're only using a small amount of service. Um, but the problem is, as, as the organizer, your costs aren't going to change all that much. Um, the only way that they'll really change is that you could potentially load up more customers on a single access point than you would be able to otherwise. Um, uh, but as Justin and Deborah kind of mentioned, it can be in some situations hard to get your access points to capacity anyway, if you're in a rural area, 
So that might not end up helping you very much. Um, uh, so that, that's kind of the first thing I'd be wary of is that it is tempting to just right off the bat say, hey, we'll, we'll give you $10 a month service or something. And I know that's not exactly the model for Althea, but you know, we'll reduce the cost a lot. Um, but you got to make sure that your own costs are being reduced and they, and they might not be. Right. Um, kind of this kind of leads to a second question. And um, once you're able to provide uh, the service, um, being it somebody be a decentralized service, how do you guarantee that um, they'll get the service that you kind of pr promise? Is it like, do you always need a line of sight? For example, if um, I have some clients that I potential clients that I see with, um, but that have line of sight, but there are a lot of trees around them, or there's also like a, there's a lot of winds, there's a lot of um, potential, um, maybe perhaps rain. Like, how do you guarantee that the the service that I'll provide to them. Yeah, yeah. I'm sorry, you're breaking up just a little bit. So uh, uh, stop me if I'm not answering the question that you asked because <laughs> um, I, I couldn't catch the whole thing. But I, I think what you asked is how do you, understanding that there's trees and some variabilities in, in weather and, and things that might come up, how do you make sure that you can provide uh, uh, reliable service? Is, is that your question? Yes. Yeah, okay. Um, so uh, in general, my general uh, guideline is to um, always have line of sight, meaning meaning you should be able to stand on the rooftop and see your relay. You know, you, there should be nothing in the way. No tree limbs, no leaves, no leaves that will blow in the way in the wind, or, you know, no trees that will grow and, and grow into the way. Um, you'll really have a lot better service if it's just a, a totally clear line of sight. And then uh, as far as uh, planning for rain and things like that, um, uh, depending on what type of equipment you use, there, there's a, a like Ubiquity, for example. If you if you go with Ubiquity equipment, you can use uh, Ubiquity's um, link budgeting tool. I'm um, uh, forgetting the name of it, but it, it's a prominent free tool that they provide, and you can put in the types of equipment that you're using and the area that they are going to be installed in, and it will help give you an idea of what the reliability of those radius will be based on the on the uh, rain that happens in that area. So, so you can plan and budget for kind of weather events. In How that, bad in is that rain fade, fade for five gigahertz? As far as I was aware, only sixty really had uh, appreciable rain fade. But maybe it's just on longer. Um, yeah, I mean, it. Uh, uh, if you're really pushing the limits of your five gigahertz link in a in a really high in a in a very very wet area, then yeah, you you should budget for rain fade. Uh, to Justin's point. Probably, uh, unless you're trying to do 10 to 15 mile shots, your prob rain fade probably isn't going to cause that much of a problem. I'm more just pointing it out because if you if you want to know the math and know the numbers, Ubiquity provides a free tool. Yeah. And rain fade is definitely well, a problem although, even on only two mile lengths yeah. if you're doing 60 gigahertz. And I think James is going to try yeah. and get some get some uh, yeah. higher speed gigabit service using 60 gigahertz. So there yeah. it's a more appreciable problem. Yeah, Around? yeah. Yep. Oh, yeah, I have go a ahead. question. Uh, so what was the name of that link again? The ubiquity ubiquity link? We're talking about the top um, Yeah, uh oh, search link called? planner um, and ubiquity together. Yeah, you the top result link. on Google. Oh, yeah. okay. I forget it's what the brand link. name for it is. I think it's yeah, like yeah, air link now. That's yeah, that sounds right. right. Yeah, I think they changed it to air link. Okay, got it. It lets you like put them on a map and actually put them in, and pick which radio you're using. And right, yeah, yeah that's, that's one little. thing I'm definitely going to want to yeah. use. Them and, yeah. uh, I also wanted to mention that uh, for Althea, you know, um, so Graham is talking about uh, spending five hundred dollars on a sector antenna that goes on a tower that's designed to serve, you know, somewhere between you know ten and maybe even up to 100 people if you really push it. Um, but if you just have somebody that you can sort of see but not really quite see, um, it may be good for you to bounce sort of, to go to a customer you can see completely. And uh, with their permission, you know, ask them if they want to be a relay, just use another customer antenna for a link to, for a direct shorter line of sight link to the next customer. Now. Obviously, you don't um, you don't want to put like a hundred people behind a regular customer antenna, but if you're just going two hops, it's going to be fine. 
Um, and if you have some sort of questionable locations or you start to worry because like uh, somebody's three or four hops deep, which Dever has a couple of people like this now, um, you start making backlinks. You don't necessarily have to use expensive equipment. You can use another $65 client antenna, you know, these like $65 like Airbeam. Oh, wait, it's... Uh, Power beam. Light beam. power beam or light beam. Oh, power yeah, beam. yeah. Uh, yeah, the power beams are closer to 100. Uh, but the light beams will go like a mile or two. The power beams will go three or four. And they're not that expensive because they're not designed to serve a bunch of people, which sort of ties into Graham's theme on don't overbuild. Um, Althea sort of encourages you to make more links uh, with with uh, cheaper equipment, but because you have more links, there is built-in redundancy. And also we've done a lot of work on the software to try and make the links behave better when overloaded. Most WISPs have a policy that like backhaul links need to be over-provisioned by a pretty large margin. And we're trying to uh, get away from that being a necessity by having our routers manage that instead. So, Graham, before you move on, I was hoping maybe you could um, talk to us a little bit about what you see in the industry around what uh, an SLA versus just consumer. Before we go into that, uh, we were kind of talking over James there to the end because he's a little oh, quiet. James, that. could you go ahead and try and finish out? Is there anything we haven't answered for you? Oh, no. That was really good. Thank cool. You. And uh, for reference, uh, when James is talking about... Uh, you know, a couple of megabits. He's in a area, uh, sort of a California Valley with lots of wine in it um, that will not be named. Um, will uh, that, uh, well, pretty much everybody's on 4G, uh, which is actually why his video was coming through crystal clear earlier, but he couldn't hear or see us at all because the download on the 4G tower is completely saturated, whereas the upload windows are sort of open. Um, and I think that's sort of an fun observation, but maybe I just am a little bit too interested in packets. Um, Deborah, what were you asking? Oh, okay. I was hoping that you could speak a little bit to what, um, how, what sort of the industry standards around who, what is an SLA, who would get that kind of SLA, um, what, what do you most consumers, what, what, like when you're setting up an ISP and you just give it a consumer, what are the sort of standards of reliability around that? What's the sort of industry norm? That we're seeing right sure. now? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So SLAs, uh, service level agreement. Um, uh, so most WISPs, and honestly, I think most residential providers won't give, won't quote a number for an SLA for residential customers. Uh, and that's because it, it's really very difficult to, uh, it, it's very expensive to build a network that will guarantee an SLA. Uh, the uh, gold standard for SLA is five nines. That means 99.999% uh, uptime. Uh, which equates to your service being down. I can't remember exactly the numbers. I think it's around five, three to five minutes a year. Justin probably knows off the top of his head. <laughs> uh, um, but it's right, it's right around in there. Um, very few ISPs will actually achieve that for a residential for a residential connection. But that's kind of the always. That's what we want to hit. That's what we'd like to get to. But it's rare to get to that. Um, I, I'd say uh, uh, I, I would propose that it's you should be charging a lot of money if you are going to start writing down SLAs in contracts <laughs> um, because it's, it can be very, very expensive and difficult to hit those numbers. Um, but just in general, if you need kind of general guidelines, I'd say most WISPs wireless ISPs are able to hit maybe maybe three nines, may, maybe maybe four. Um, so 99.9 so .9 to 99.99% uptime, which ends up being... Um, somewhere in the range of maybe a couple of hours of downtime per year spread across the year. Um, and, uh, uh, but also that's, that's an average across all of their customers. So there are likely to be some customers who experience, um, you know, hours or even a day or two worth of downtime, but hopefully it's a small number of customers compared to the total who, who experience much less. And on average, you're seeing a couple of hours each. Is that what you're looking for, Deborah? 
Yeah, I just wanted to give them a sense of what I know. Chris was talking about reliability. Um, so it's something yeah. that people ask for that, and so I wanted to give them an idea about what is the industry standard. Um, you know, and I think yeah. especially as you start out, you won't have that many redundant links. But certainly, that the goal is to build in. You know, to have have more redundant links, more different gateways, and so that um, you do get to that point um, where you are able to do um, some yeah. nines. But um, I, I don't think that uh, most internet service providers do any kind of actual guarantees. Uh, that, that's an SLA. You don't really use it as a business and you're charging a lot of money. So I don't want you to also like you're accountable to those, that, that kind yeah. of agreement. Yeah. Um, so, I'll go ahead and take a minute to uh, sort of state that uh, uh, in at least uh, Deborah's network, network for a point of comparison, uh, she has relays, sometimes many hops deep. Uh, and we're normally on two nines, uh, but we had to take a relay down for service earlier, and their redundant link was uh, sort of borderline because it was a dual. Uh, anyways, I won't go into that story. It's sort of long. Um, and the long story short is that that would bring us down to like one nine for the past two or three weeks. Um, but we normally stick at two, uh, so 99.9, .9, and 99.99 uh, .99 .99 is possible when we're not uh, testing things and updating the network. Three nines is, I think you're going to definitely need redundant links to get up there. Uh. Um, the, the things that really help people get to the, the higher higher redundancy are redundant links, but also um, uh, battery backup power. Because um, a lot of times power um, is the weakest link on your network. Um, and, and even it, being honest, uh, your upstream provider will also not hit five nines, honestly, most of the time. So if you only have one upstream provider, you're only going to be as reliable as they are at best. Yeah. So for reference, um, two nines, so 99.99 .99 is 10 minutes of downtime a week. Uh, maybe uh, off by factor of 10 here. I'm just trying to... Uh, I, I typically I it's, it includes the pre decimal point nine. So two nines yeah. would just be 99%. Okay, then. Yeah. Okay, then. So I guess that's three nines. Okay, that's sort of a weird way to count it. But yeah, so 10 Five, minutes downtime a week is yeah. like sort of a, the, the, the floor. If you're going to be down more than that, you have a problem. Yeah. But just using Althea yeah. as is without redundant links, we don't have trouble doing better than that, is sort of what I wanted to set the floor for. Yeah. Any other questions along those lines? Cool. Um, so the next thing, um, the next thing I want to move to, kind of shifting topics a lot, is if you, when you get to the point that you would like to hire someone to do some of the work, um, whether it's you know a dedicated employee of your organization or looking to find a contractor. Um, so I'm going to run through that. So before I shift gears, since it's kind of a big topic shift. And ask one more time if anybody wants to jump back to anything we've already talked about. I uh, I kind of do. Okay. Um, so in regards to you know the equipment, that's where I'm. Our, I'm still on that. I want to go over and make sure that I have everything. Um, so the beams, um, we understand the cost for that, um, five hundred dollars each roughly. The routers. Um, you know, the basics, $60, the premium, $100 to $200. Um, and then the gateway. The um, the main costs in the gateway would be the data, correct? Uh, uh, it depends on how you how you structure your agreement with, with your provider. Sometimes it's, uh, a lot of times it's a fixed flat rate plus plus data, or sometimes it's just a fixed flat rate to be burstable to a certain certain speed. Um, uh, uh, Deborah might be able to talk about what, what you've got, but that's pretty common. It just depends on your provider. Yeah, I mean, I think that, I think talking about back is a really, really expansive discussion, and there's lots of creative <laughs> ways to do it, and there's lots of different prices depending on where you're at. Um, yeah. and, uh, but yes, it's typically sold as a lease. Um, so you pay what they call an MRC, which is a monthly reincurring cost, um, and uh, it's usually it's wholesale. Um, it's dedicated. 
Um, and you can either get like, you know, some form of transit or transport. And then there's some other ideas about that. But um, yeah, so typically you're looking probably at a data center, probably close to six or 700 bucks a month for a gigabit per second, probably. Um, and then some roof lease associated with that. Um, with the, if you do do a data center, you won't have an NRC, which is non-recurring cost or construction cost related to a build out. But if you do decide to do a gateway in a, a neighborhood or with a business, then you, you may have construction costs. Um, but we'll help you through that process as well and um, go through kind of go through the whole process as well as we have um, a video uh, about backhaul in specific that Graham did earlier for us last year at Althea Palooza. Right. Um, okay. Yeah, that's that definitely does uh, help a lot. Um, other than that, um, another thing that I would like to know is the the tower costs. Um, do you guys have like uh, anywhere where I can look and see exactly how much it would cost for each like part of the equipment for the tower? Yeah, that Amazon list includes what we use here for um, for class guy, which you might use in, in lots of flat roofs. This will work just fine, which is a telescoping pole with a non-penetrating roof mount. It's just a flat mount that's anchored with cement or sandbags or something. And then where can I see that list? So, it's on the forum. Okay. And then it so, links to the Amazon shopping list. Cool. cool. Okay. Awesome. All right. I guess uh, that pretty much answers my question regarding the equipment. Um, cool. Awesome. Cool. Okay. Then I'm going to jump into uh, what to look for in an installer. Uh, so just some context. Uh, uh, a lot of when a wireless service provider starts, a lot of the times the way it goes is somebody starts this as a side business in their garage, you know, um, and uh, or or as an add-on to an existing business that they already have in an area. And a lot of the times, what they're doing is, at first, at least, just doing all of the work themselves, um, uh, which means you know, putting up putting up the tower, putting up the relays, taking calls from customers, getting them signed up going to their home and putting equipment on their rooftops, doing the whole installation at their home. Uh, everything A to Z, all the way to getting these customers customers installed uh, and, and taking their support phone calls. Um, obviously, that, you know, that works for a while. I've seen people do everything themselves up even to several hundred customers. It seems the, the most I've kind of seen with a one or two person crew is, is like maybe 300, 250 to 350 subscribers um, before before it just gets to be way too much to answer the phones and do all of the installs and do all of the support calls and everything. Um, and in some places, depending on uh, the market and how spread out it is and, and uh, with the type of homes you're installing, a lot of different factors can mean that uh, it's a lot fewer customers that can be supported by just a really small crew. I would like so to add in a I would like to know, uh, add in a little something on that. Um, sure. Regarding taking phone calls, um, you know, the phone calls can be outsourced as well. Would that be allowed? If like, let's say if I was getting like a lot of phone calls for my business, can I outsource and have other people answer the phone calls? Is that like fine? Um, uh, I think that, are, are you directing that toward Althea more, Justin or Deborah? I, 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 yeah, yeah. Certainly I'll something. Yeah. In, in general. Like, would uh, that be fun? Like, if I was getting yeah. hundreds of phone calls a day? Um, yeah, exactly. So, uh, with Althea, there's two incentives. There's the bandwidth forwarding, um, where if you're hosting hardware, you're running a gateway, you get money per gigabyte. And then there's the other money that's a subscription fee that goes to the organization, um, yeah. which. Uh, which would go to your business or your nonprofit or whatever. Now, however you see a fit as the organizer to allocate those funds to correctly support your subscribers in that network is how whatever works best for you. Sure. Um, you know, I think that there, there's a, it says a lot, I think, to be able to offer local support, but that doesn't necessarily have to be you yourself. Um, that could be whatever, whatever works. It's also in, 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 in our experience, I would say it's unlikely, uh, like severely unlikely that you're going to get a lot of calls. Um, you may have like a problem customer that uh, that uh, calls you at, for reasons that don't make sense. But in, in yeah. general, your average customer will be more likely to have a problem and not tell you about it. 
which is also bad. Um, right. And uh, yeah. also, uh, Austin put a question in the chat. So could you read that out, Deborah? Yeah, it says a question for Graham. Um, if, if this hasn't been covered yet, does he recommend Althea or using X company using Althea Tech leasing hardware, having customers buy their own recommended hardware? So this is the case. Um, uh, customers Maybe that was blame James, not Austin. I Sorry. <laughs> um, this is the case in where customers blame everything on the ISP when it's the router that's that's not on or off. I, I, yeah, I think he's talking about maybe a little bit more of a managed services um, or I, I don't know what you've maybe seen, Graham, uh, in the industry, some different ways people tackle tackle that. I mean, we do have a few supported routers. It's only a couple of routers that we can use, but um, um, maybe you can speak to your thoughts on that. Yeah, um, I think that's... Uh... Uh, if I understand the question correctly, I think it is kind of a unique thing to Althea in some ways, um, where you know you have the option to to buy your own hardware and, and run your own relays and, and kind of be even your own identity even even inside the network. Um, uh, uh, oh, somebody somebody's lost audio. Looks like yeah. Um, uh, so, um, but I would say you know. It used to be in the kind of early days of, of wireless ISPs that it was very common for the wireless ISP to ask each customer to buy their own hardware. Um, and then, you know, I remember the first one that I worked with, that was part of our sales pitch. We say, hey, you know, you buy the hardware and then, you know, if you ever leave our service, it's yours and you can like try to resell it or you can hook up with another wireless provider or whatever. And uh, the, the wireless ISP industry kind of got away from that because um, it wasn't common for that equipment to be able to be reused with another provider. The next provider that would come along would usually use something different. Um, with Althea, though, it might make sense um, where, you know, that equipment can be reused or you can kind of be on, on your own relay or whatever. Uh, so so I think it, it kind of comes back down to just the market and how you're positioned in the market. Uh, mm -hmm. And you've kind of got to look at the total cost to get on Althea versus the total cost to get on Comcast and try to be competitive. Um, at least enough that people are willing to try it out. Yeah, I, I think also kind of part of your overall support, um, you know, the, the, the router is going to be a standard router. Um, we only have a few supported ones um, and it's going to run Althea specific hardware. Um, we do have some really great organizers tools. Um, Justin uh, built a really great thing called a uh, router rescue, which is an app for your Android phone. So organizers can come into the house and, um, you know, reboot, reflash the router and, um, you know, do a lot of diagnostic tools um, you know, right from the app on your phone. So we, we do try to help you out um, with some tools to be able to do that kind of thing. Um, so at this point, there really isn't something that's, you know, necessarily uh, that you would want to rent. And I, I think, is that is that your question? Is that um, James's question? Is that what they're asking about? Is like it, 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 people not being happy with the router performance because it's going to be always Althea's software. So uh, I think I might have called out the names wrong. I can't really see the chat because uh, of the way I'm trying to DJ mm. this whole performance here. Um, but uh, it, it, it may be reasonable uh, to rent some of the tower equipment um, because that's, you know, that's radios. It's pretty generic. You could probably uh, return those or reuse those. Um, the home routers, uh, the cost is not that bad. You know, they're in the 60, oh, well, you know, in the 60 to uh, 150 mm -hmm. range, if uh, if you want to include the slow and the fast options, that sort of stuff. So, uh, yeah, that's the, that's sort of it. Deborah's been upgrading some people in her network from the lower end router to the higher end router, especially as they become relays and they start to do more. Um, and what she typically does is that she gives is that uh, depending on the exact situation. Um, she either uh, gives them the higher end router for free if she's a little bit worried about the clients behind them, um, or if uh, people just want you know better performance or longer range Wi-Fi, uh, she prorates it and then takes their cheaper router and gives it to somebody who uh, and and uses it for a new install. So you can definitely reuse equipment within your network, uh, and that happens quite often actually. Like a core charge, like when you bring your alternator in or something <laughs> like that.
Anything else on that, or should we move on to back back toward uh, hiring? Let's move back to hiring. I think that's that's definitely some cool. good stuff. And hopefully, James will join yeah. us. I know they were the ones to get some yeah. good information about that. Uh, let's see. Okay, so so hiring somebody again. Um, yeah, at some point, the phone calls and the install. If you're growing, which hopefully all of you are, <laughs> the the phone calls and the installs will become too much. Like Mark said, and I, I have a little section on this later that uh, we're, we might not get to, but but it is definitely possible to outsource the phone calls. Um, and what a lot of places will do is something like, especially at first, uh, uh, work with an outsourced company to take like evening and weekend calls, but then keep taking them during the day so that you can actually get some sleep. Um, but you're also still talking to your customers, uh, you know, and not, not outsourcing everything. So there's some things that can be done around there. But uh, uh, very often, one of the very first things that uh, that a, a wireless uh, organization will hire for is an installer, um, somebody to go out and do the field work. Uh, this is uh, really important because um, it's, it's and a lot of times, the bulk of the work that needs to be done. And it can be pretty difficult to find somebody who can effectively do this work in the area that you're in. So, so, you know, it's a, it's a task that requires a lot of thought, <laughs> um, uh, to get right. Um, it's certainly possible. And, and Deborah and uh, I talked about this a little bit the other day, but it's certainly possible to try to contract this piece out and might be preferable in some cases to find a way to contract it out rather than hiring someone directly into your organization. Uh, the benefits of contracting it out are that you might be able to find someone who is in a line of contracting work that they already have. For example, a lot of the tools uh, that are required, they may already have the insurance that's required or any permits or uh, licenses that are required to do the work. Um, uh, you know, in general, they may just be already set up to, to do this type of work. Um, you'll end up paying them a little bit more probably than you would an employee, but you won't have to buy them tools and insurance and uh, uh, get them licensed. Uh, you may not need to do as much training. So that's uh, that's helpful if you can find it. Um, what I've seen a lot of people do at first is try to contract with like a satellite TV provide. There are uh, a lot of the satellite TV install and uh, maintenance work is done by contractors, um, uh, and so it's I've I've heard of a lot of companies trying to find those contractors and add some work to their list to come in and, and do you know wireless install and, and maintenance. Um, uh, to be honest, I've never seen that work particularly well. Um, uh, not to say it couldn't work for anybody, but it seems like those folks are um, uh, busy enough that it's hard to get them to take on the extra work. Um, and also, uh, they um, tend to have very strict internal rules inside the organization about never actually getting up on a rooftop. Um, they do all of their work from the ladder on the side of the house uh, but never actually step onto the rooftop, um, which can maybe possibly be done for, for wireless, but uh, it's pretty common that a wireless install will actually need your wireless equipment to get a little bit higher up on the roof. Uh, so uh, another thing that is maybe a potential possibility is just looking for like a local handyman uh, who can take some who can take some kind of regular work. What I've seen work actually reasonably well, excuse me, in the past is even something like reaching out to a local handyman and saying, hey, we'll, we will kind of put you on retainer one day a week or something. Every Tuesday you work for us, we pay you whether we have work or not. Um, and then we're just gonna try to load up all the work we've got in that time. Um, that actually, that's, I've seen that work actually reasonably well. Uh, uh, the only hard part being there that the handyman person is great at fixing toilets, but not always great at you know fixing Windows laptops, <laughs> so so they may not have kind of the contextual IT knowledge that can be helpful as for an installer. Mark, so, got any um, there? another thing I wanted to add in is I was actually looking at Indeed.com, and okay. you can hire people from there. I was thinking, or yeah. there's some apps that you can download, such as Tackle, which is great for handyman. Sure. Um, I've hired a couple people on there to help me out with some issues I've had in my uh, place where I live. So. Yeah. Yeah, definitely possible to find people. Um, one one thing that I would stress pretty heavily is that the uh, uh, um, the reliability and redundancy and general performance of your network will rely a lot on how well your antennas are aimed. Um, 
And it can be really difficult to get a contractor, particularly a contractor who doesn't have any kind of personal investment in your company to spend the time, have the patience to, to make sure the install is done properly. Right. Even with hired employees, it's hard to get them to do it right and spend the time it takes. But particularly with a contractor, it's really hard to get them to spend the extra 15 minutes up on the roof tweaking that thing to make sure that you're not going to have to come back. But it can make a big difference to your organization if you can do it right the first time and not have to come back for five years instead of one. Um, so, not, not, uh, you know, just something to be aware of as you hire somebody, you've really got to stress with them that there are some pieces of this that are really, really critical and um, can't be, you know, shortchanged. Got it. Yeah. Um, cool. Uh, so, so yeah, hi hiring contractors. Uh, let's see. Oh, uh, and um, the other piece that you have to be aware of. Oh, I was also going to point out that some of the some of the better hires, I've, if you do go the um, uh, hiring internally route, I've seen a lot of kind of retired military folks make good installers, if, especially if you have a kind of retired military community in your area. Uh, depending on what branch or what they were doing, they tend to be the type of folks who have done some field work um, and uh, are used to following instructions because <laughs> that's what the military does really well, right? It's, Put, put on instructions and um, uh, and intend to be just looking for work and, and generally capable folks. So uh, I've seen that work well if, if you're looking for that. Um, uh, and uh, uh, just as a note, as soon as you start to hire people, particularly installers or field workers, is when you have to start to really pay attention to OSHA regulations. Obviously, you want everybody to come home safely. Um, uh, and that should be your top priority if you go uh, even if you're working for yourself, but especially if you start to hire somebody, make sure that they come home safely. Um, but, uh, you know, following the OSHA regulations are related to, but not exactly the same as trying to make sure people come home safely. So you, you kind of have to do both. You have to make sure people come home safe, and you also have to pay attention to what the regulations are so that you don't get in trouble for OSHA, even if nobody gets hurt. So is there, a, is there a reference or is there a, a good place to do some reading about that when folks are starting to expand and consider? Yeah. Uh, let's see. If you you can actually, uh, I don't remember the exact website, but if you just Google for OSHA rooftop regulations, it'll come up. You'll find the OSHA website and you can read through the regulations. They're fairly clearly written. It can be a little bit hard because they are written very specifically for certain industries, not ours. So, for example, you'll find a section on people um, doing roofing and adding new roofs, um, and, you know, or put it, putting on a new roof on somebody's, uh, you're tearing off the old shingles, putting on the new ones. You'll find a section on that, and it talks about how those people should work on rooftops, and it's, like, kind of related but not exactly to what we're doing. And so it's a little bit hard to know if we need to uh, follow those same regulations. Um, uh, I'm not going to tell you what regulations you should or should not follow <laughs> um that that's up to you <laughs> uh but you can definitely find them and read them online and uh actually um I, I will note that in the past i've been a little bit hesitant to reach out directly to osha osha always offers in every area if you go to their website or reach out to them they always offer hey we will come out and see what you're doing and give you recommendations for how to do it safely and how to follow osha regulations I've always shied away from that a little bit because I didn't really want to get on their radar. Um, uh, but I have actually pretty recently um, been in a situation where we just went ahead and did that, had them come out, worked with them. And it was actually a, a pretty positive experience. They were really excited that we were trying to do the right thing. They understood that we had our own uh, kind of restrictions and the unique situations, but they were uh, happy to provide insight, help us figure out how to do the right thing. And it, and it actually worked out pretty well. Um, they didn't, let us off the hook. We still had to make changes to the way that our people worked to follow the regulations, but it, it was a positive interaction. So that's something to think about. Great. And forgive Great. me if you're going to talk about this already, but could you go for like, if you're going to be interviewing an installer, some things that you would look for, some questions that you would ask? Sure. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So as you're looking for it as well, and yeah, again, you, whether it's an internal hire or a contractor, um, it tends to you tend to find uh, one of two things. You're either looking for somebody who's pretty IT savvy, and you're kind of looking at at IT savvy type folks, and then trying to find somebody who's also okay getting on a ladder, or you have found somebody who's pretty handy and good with their hands, good with tools, and good with getting on ladders. And you're trying to find somebody who also has some IT knowledge and like is comfortable using a computer. 
And finding somebody who has both of those things is the, the challenging part of, of finding a good installer. And so, you know, depending on which, where you look and who you're talking to, you, you may know based on their background, you, you may already be able to deduce, hey, they're, you're, you're pretty decent at IT, you know, you come from an IT background or whatever, and then you need to just figure out if they can get up on a ladder or vice versa. Um, so the important questions would differ depending on kind of the person you're talking to. Um, but some of the things I always ask to make sure, you know, you can, uh, one kind of trick I, we, we've used here is like, uh, hey, tell me, you know, let's do a little role play. Tell me your grandma calls up and says her Netflix isn't working. I'm going to be your grandma. Tell me how you like help me troubleshoot that over the phone. Um, like what, what do you have grandma do to get her Netflix back on and what do you have her check and stuff like that. And that can kind of working through that can kind of give you an idea if they have some, some kind of, they, they don't have to know how to write code or anything, but are they at least tech savvy enough to say, Hey, does, does the rest of your internet service work? Like, is it asking you to log in? Did you reboot your router? Like just kind of general uh, high level understanding of, of, of technical stuff. Uh, and then on the other end, just go ahead. Yeah. So I just wanted to sort of get in and I'm sorry to, to, uh, to, no, to disrupt. Maybe I should have waited to the end here. So uh, there's sort of two classes of problems that installer, uh, that, that these uh, field people solve. One of them is like the initial setup and hookup of the equipment. And if you have things set up and documented correctly, they don't need to be that good technically. They need to be able to look at a laptop and have the patience to do the antenna aiming, which is something that you can teach. Anybody who's handy will sort of be able to get it. Uh, there's a little bit of a skill to it, but it's not that hard to teach. Um, but the other class of the problem is that the, the customer is having an issue, and it may not be related to your hardware at all. So um, you're not going to be sending, uh, so the reason I interrupted is to say that you're not going to be sending uh, people in blind to this. We will have tools for you that will let you see like if a client's router and their antenna is still up. So you will know when you are dealing with like an aiming or installation problem versus when you're dealing with uh, what may be a client laptop problem or perhaps a Wi-Fi signal strength problem. And uh, figuring out which one is which is where these skills really come into play and where they're absolutely needed. We also have one other thing too. So after um, after you do the regular wireless ISP type of install where you put the antenna on the, on the, on the home and then you wired it into the Althea router in the home, there's, there's some Althea familiarity that your subscribers will need. They, you need to know um, where a little bit about their dashboard, um, about the billing, um, and then they're also going to need to have some help potentially using their their Coinbase app to get um, to get their cryptocurrency for and, and have some good terminology around that. So um, this may not be one person fits all. I mean, in a lot of cases, mo most cases when I when we have um, installations in my network, I have myself come and do a lot of the customer service stuff, and then. Um, a handy person or a helper do the the actual installing. So, um, because I think I think it would be very difficult probably to find someone who's who's handy, who's good at aiming, and then is also really great at at explaining you know Althea and um, a little bit about your organization and a little bit about the dashboard. Um, and then we'll have some we'll have some references for you as well and some standard operating procedures. Um, hopefully, a binder at some point of <laughs> all this great knowledge. Um, yeah, or trap or keeper, potentially. Um, <laughs> so, you know, the great thing about trap or keeper is you can put pens in there. That's that's the thing. You can have yes, a little Debra, slot. You continue pen. to rant to us young people about the benefits of trap or keepers, and I don't believe I've ever seen one. But anyways, so um, there's there's not that much of a difference actually. I think they went out of style in a span of like three or four years, and then. <laughs> So there's a really like solid divide. Um, <laughs> so, anyways, <laughs> the the uh, uh, Deborah does spend some time setting up people with like Coinbase and such. Um, but once they're set up, we don't find that they have any trouble using it on a month to month basis. Um, and you know, people um, often think like, "Hey, cryptocurrency is super complicated." Um, consider for a moment how you pay your electric company or like your water bill and how hard that was to set up normally like bank draft stuff or something like that and realize that uh coinbase is not that hard in in 
in comparison. Now, having some help to have people set it up does really, really get get everyone over the hump. Um, so you can't exactly just let people go with it. But once it's set up, we don't find that there are too many problems with it. And uh, then the last part I wanted to say is that you can do an install over multiple days, have somebody come and do the antenna, and then come and do the like uh, customer uh, customer uh, onboarding. And we also do we also do provide what we call a welcome packet, which has just um, you know some material, some contact information about who to call when there's a problem, um, and then also some referencing to to how to how to pay, which we have available if anybody wants to take a look at it ahead of time, which is um, althea.net forward slash top hyphen up, um, and then you can see kind of the the steps, and and a lot of folks have just figured it out on their their own as well too. So um, Justin's right, you can do two steps or. Um, what was kinda, that link again, by chance? Um, it is althea.net forward slash top hyphen up, top up. Okay, cool. Got it. Thank you. Um, is that going to be forwarding to uh, add, add, add dash run? Yeah. yeah, so we put in a redirect to add funds. You can go ahead and send people to the new link, but the redirect is going to stay there um, okay. because the old uh, because we have that old link in older dashboards and even in text messages, and people may be using the old text messages. And oh yeah, that's something I forgot. Um, if the user so desires, they can input their their phone number into the router, and their router will text message them when they get below uh -huh. a certain amount. Um, it won't send them a text more than once every 24 hours, and it will never send them a text unless their balance is empty and it's actively causing service disruption. Uh, we're working on a little something that'll let people, uh, that'll let organizers like you be able to communicate with their users. For example, if there's a network problem, you could send out sort of a mass text like we're having issues, we're working on it. Um, but that's not quite ready yet mostly because of the opt-out considerations uh, for the for the for the low balance stuff there's just a little checkbox on the router and they can uncheck it so that's really easy in a larger sense of like a mass text sense you'd want a separate opt-out and managing that is somewhat more difficult so that's what i'm working on i would actually come in handy for marketing right there yeah, that's that is why the opt-out is so important <laughs> Cool. Any other questions on hiring or training an installer? I mean, obviously it's a big topic, but just trying to cram what we can in the last 11 minutes here. <laughs> yeah, not really. Um, not if, if nobody noticed, Austin offered himself as a competent installer. So thank you, Austin. <laughs> yeah. I direct folks your way. Um, I, had, I had just a, a couple of quick observations. Um, I, I noticed there's quite a quite a disparity between, uh, like Austin said, he he's very good at doing clean wiring, right? Between people that do like tidy work, or I mean, I've come to, I'm sure you have as well too. Like previous wireless ISPs or ISPs have come and done really untidy work, or in the in the home, you know, it's it's just not done in a really professional way. Is there any way that when you're interviewing someone, you can get a sense of of whether they'll do, you know, good some tidy work and, and work with the customers. Um, uh, I, if anybody knows of one, I'd love to hear it. it. That's pretty hard to figure out short of working with them for a while. And, you know, having maybe you have some kind of a probationary hiring period where you say, you know, hey, we're going to bring you on for a couple of months and then we'll check in in three months and, and see how your work's going. Uh, or the other piece is that you just have to have really strong training programs to make sure people that you hire understand your standards and and that they're trained to follow them, um, you know even if they come in not quite ready to to do that. Uh, but yeah, that's that's a hard one. It's hard to make sure people are going to do that unless you can work with them a little bit. Yeah, I definitely. There, recommend. Go ahead. Abby. Is there anywhere where um, I can actually like print out um, like a standard um, procedures protocols for them to yeah. follow? For my IT people to follow or installers we're, to follow me. We're working on some on our side of things. Graham, do you have something on your website? Um, I do have a pretty generic how to do an install. Um, 
uh, that you, you're, uh, in case anybody doesn't know, my website is startyourownisp.com. <laughs> yep. If you feel free to uh, browse through it, there is a section on there on doing an install. It won't apply directly to Althea, particularly around the uh, cryptocurrency stuff um, and, and maybe some other things, but the physical aspects of doing it will probably relate directly. So um, we are actually about to, to start some interviews for, for installers. Um, one thing I'm worried about is we may get somebody that can put in a, a couple hours every week reliably, but what, what do you find, like, do you, do you find that you need a pool of some people that have extra time um, for emergencies, like a storm rolls in and knocks someone's thing off or something? Um, you know, we want to get that turned around as quickly as possible, but maybe not everyone's available. What do you, what do you do to, um, or what would you recommend in that sort of situation to help cover that? Yeah. Yeah. That's a fair question. I mean, and at some point, obviously you've got to kind of take your situation and do the best with you can with what you've got. Um, but, uh, you know, yeah, the more people you can have available, the better for those things. Um, and, and also a little bit of that comes back to, again, training and and really kind of demanding a high level of work. Because if, if it's installed properly the first time and things are tightened down and it's aimed properly and, and the lines are secured to the roof and all of that, then a storm blowing through will have pretty minimal impact. Um, and, you know, you won't need to do all hands on deck to get out there. But uh, certainly there are storms that are going to cause problems and, and you, you are probably going to have to run out and fix things. And uh, yeah, I mean, the more people you have available to do that, the better. And not just people, but tools and ladders and vehicles. Um, and sometimes early on, that just means biting the bullet and taking the, you know, you hit, you have the storm and you just have to wait it out. And that, you know, that sucks, but you do what you can with what you've got. Right. Okay. Well, sure. Yeah. And in, in the country, a lot of people are, are more um, flexible when it comes to that. Like, I personally live in an area where if it ices over, we may be out of electricity for a week. Yeah. And that's <laughs> normal. Um, we're setting up in a city where if, you're, if your internet's out more than a couple hours, you're on the phone threatening to cancel service. Yeah. So that, that's the kind of thing I worry about. So yeah, for, for sure. Yeah. Reference with our, with, with like the standard amounts, uh, which are like 10 bucks, but they're pretty sturdy. Um, if you tighten them down and the equipment you use, if it's mounted properly and you tack the cables to the walls right um, and all of that, then uh, you're not going to have issues until the storm starts knocking out power to the neighborhood. Um, I don't know if you've ever walked around like a neighborhood with a uh, with uh, with like overhead power lines and cable installed up there, but it's pretty janky and uh, the and uh, it's definitely not more durable than the antennas just because of the length of the wires in some cases. Um, and they don't typically have issues until you get, you know, like a 40, 50 mile an hour winds for a while. And at that point, everybody's power is down um, and you'll have a little bit of time. Um, I think at that point, the most important thing you can do is communicate well and uh, be on top of fixing it. And like I said, we're going to have tools for you to let you see who's online and who's not so you'll be able to be sitting there uh, even during the storm and sort of counting up a list of where you need to go and what needs to happen and uh it's not exactly going to be easy um but we're not talking about like an everyday thunderstorm here we're talking like you know a tropical storm rolls through or like something pretty serious before you're doing this that's right um uh, yeah I think what I mean, Justin said is right. You're definitely going to have to plan for it as well as you can, but um, hopefully it's not a common occurrence. Although I would point out that actually um, uh, ice is one of the harder things to combat with a wireless network. Uh, you, you do end up, even in it, storms that aren't that bad, but if it's icing up, you'll get ice building up on the dishes, particularly you know the ones that are facing into the wind. Uh, and it doesn't take very much ice on those dishes for the for the wireless link to drop. So that is a problem. Um, usually uh, the radios themselves uh, generate a little bit of heat and usually within a couple of hours of the of the ice or snow stopping, they'll uh, clear themselves and, and, and operation resumes fine. Um, but uh, you know, in a really heavy ice or snowstorm, you, you may end up going to people's houses and knocking ice off their, off their dishes. And that, 
time consuming, obviously. Would the so, Arizona heat affect them or? They, uh, uh, you should. Summer here, so. No, yeah, totally. Uh, the radios, you, you can check their operating temperature ranges. They should, uh, all the ones that I've looked at, common ones are designed to survive in heat like that. Um, but definitely okay. check operating ranges. Possibly a, a bigger concern in your area, uh, or at least as big of a concern would be dust. Um, and right. so you would want to make sure uh, things, uh, things are taped up well and sealed well anywhere where dust could potentially get in. In, in dust storms. Got it. Yeah. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, I heard stories from an Alaskan wireless ISP at a conference once about how he had uh, heaters for his antennas. Yeah. Huh. Wow. Yeah, I've seen that. Yeah. Or sometimes, uh, it depends on what type of antenna, but some antennas you can put on a, a kind of a cloth. Uh, radome on the front, and then the wind vibrates the cloth a little bit, and it, it can kind of keep the ice from, from building up. But that's something it's in. Cool. Uh, how, how much does uh, the cloth, the waterproofing thing, cost? Uh, sorry, what was that? It broke a little bit. Sorry, you said there was a cloth you could use that could keep oh, ice. Yeah. How much does that cost? Uh, uh, well, it, it only works on certain kinds of antennas, and, and as soon as I said that, I realized that probably the majority of what folks here are going to be using is Ubiquity, and uh, I don't think Ubiquity radios have that as an option, so maybe I shouldn't have brought it up. It might not be relevant, <laughs> um, but uh, uh, just for reference, if you were to go that route, the, the cloth itself isn't particularly expensive. It's really just a piece of canvas. You could even use your own if you wanted to, but it is more for a different kind of wireless connection than you're probably likely to encounter in the early days of, of running as an Althea organizer. So um, it may yeah. not be relevant to you. You're thinking more about ground like a, like a backhaul link. Like if yeah. you want to, if you want to get wireless, if you want to get internet from here over here, you know, 11 kilometers or something like that, maybe you're making an 11 gigahertz link or you're doing a backhaul link of some sort, then you're going to have these parabolic dishes that are going to be a little bit bigger and then you might have that kind of, and then you need that reliability too, because that's your, backhaul link um so it, it, it when if in, and when that kind of becomes a possibility then we can you know kind of talk more about what specifically that might look like yeah. but i think in the northwest you know the most you're we're gonna be worried about here is that really viscous rain that we get this very <laughs> very thick yeah. looking rain but that but typically that's just an event that comes through and then dissipates pretty quickly yeah what well, one more thing you can do for ice and and rain to some extent is water phobic paint coating mm -hmm. on the on the dishes uh it should be transparent to rf uh i do have it linked on the website again if you want to check it out but if you just search for water phobic coating or, or something like that um there's there's a paint you can paint on the dishes it's not terribly expensive you do it once a year at the end of the summer and it can it won't totally prevent ice and and water buildup but it'll help a lot and it'll help it clear faster also so that's an option also Cool. Um, let's see. So uh, uh, we're, we're down. Oh, we're actually at time. Um, uh, uh, I had a couple of other things, but I think we hit the, the biggest things I wanted to hit. Um, Deborah, is there anything else you, you're, you're like, we, we got to hit or, uh, or, any, or any other questions? I think that's kind of what, um, if, if maybe you have another link to, to where, what kind of equipment that might need. Um, oh yeah. Let me post that. Yeah. yeah. That's one thing I want to know is I want to know exactly like what the router and everything looks like. So therefore mm -hmm. I can check it out online somewhere. Yeah. And I think, so I don't, Kind of if you just have a tool set, like this is the tool set yeah. that you need, um, you know, and we have, I, I did a quick little video too about what's in my rig when I do installs um, that's on YouTube as well kind of cross reference yeah. it with Graham's list. Yeah, the link I just posted is basically like a, what you would need to just do your first few installs list. So, um, you know, if you're doing them yourself uh, or if you hire an installer, this is a, a good starting list of equipment to look at and, and, and purchase um, to be able to handle most install tasks, wireless install tasks that come your way. Um, uh, obviously you might need to augment this for your specific situation, but it should be a pretty good start. 
Just really briefly on that, I know different wireless ISPs do different things around communal tools or if everybody has their own toolbox. Or did you wanna just speak just real quickly to a couple different ways that that can be done? Yeah, sure, uh, yeah. So um, uh, getting started, like I mentioned before, a lot of people are just kind of doing it themselves. They, they've got their own, you know, throw it in the back of their vehicle from their garage or whatever and go out and do it on their own. Um, the list that I have posted, uh, you tend to end up needing an, basically that list for each installer that is going to be working simultaneously. So when you get to the point that you have more than one person working in the field at any given time, you probably need a full toolkit for each of them. Um, uh, um, although, uh, you know, if you if you are working with multiple contractors or something, for example, and they're working on different days or different times, you could you could try to just share a single set of tools. Um, as, as wireless ISPs get bigger, what they tend to try to do is have, um, uh, it gets a little complicated, but basically have one vehicle and tools for each simultaneous schedule that's going on at any given time. Um, so, uh, uh, you know, they may have, they may have six installers, but at any given time, they only have four of them working at once. So they'd only have four sets of ladders and tools and vehicles. Um, but that's more a concern as you get quite quite a bit larger. You know, you have to get through using needing one person before you need four. <laughs> so, is that, your, is, that, is that your question, or was I off there? Yeah, no, that was right. And then the last thing would be okay. um, just uh, around any kind of like, typically just use a spreadsheet for equipment that you have. Yeah, um, yeah. So kind of tracking inventory and equipment. There, there's um, there's a couple of pieces. So so once you start getting some equipment out in the field. One, you want to know what you have out in the field deployed um, for for your own tracking purposes, as well as kind of understanding if something goes wrong. You want to be able to troubleshoot it better and know what's there. And then there's a separate inventory problem that is, hey, we need to know how much inventory we have so that we know when we need to reorder. You know, we, we need to know how many homes we can go install before we need to reorder equipment. Um, uh, in both cases, it seems like the very early days wireless organizations tend to just start with a spreadsheet and have a spreadsheet that lists, you know, at this address, we installed X, Y, Z on X date. And, you know, these were the original uh, radio readings, the RSSI readings, and the speed test was this. And then you can go back and look at that later. There are a lot of tools, software tools that will also track that information for you. Ubiquity provides one called uh, UNMS um, and a separate one called UCRM. Uh, as I understand today, uh, th th those platforms have features that will also kind of help monitor your network and also do like billing um, and stuff like that for a more traditional WISP. Uh, as I understand today, the, the equipment monitoring piece wouldn't work with Althea due to the way that things are routed, um, although that may be coming, from what I understand from Deborah. Uh, but um, you could still use that product. It's a free product, and you could still potentially use it just to track what equipment is where. Um, you could just, you know, you can put in your customers and say at this customer, I put this radio and this equipment and, and keep track of it that way. So it could be helpful. Um, and again, that's just called UNMS. It's ubiquity network monitoring service, I think. And, it, and it's free. Um, and then as far as, you know, just tracking what's in your warehouse, if you have a warehouse or what's in your garage, if you're just using your garage, which a lot of people are right at first. Um, I, I think just keeping a, a, a spreadsheet is there are, uh, you know, inventory management systems that will do a, a very thorough job of that, but they tend to be quite expensive. So um, for the first, you know, several hundred customers, it's probably better just to keep a spreadsheet and save some money. Um, yeah. Uh, was there another piece to your question or was that it? <laughs> I think that, that basically kind of covers it too, just to kind of okay. flag for our new new folks, you know, what they yeah, yeah. kind of want to think on, on the radar on that kind of thing. So I think that was yeah, yeah. pretty much everything, unless any of the, these folks have any other questions. Um, yeah, yeah. Any, any yeah, I may actually have a, a few. Um, cool. So the first thing, I just want to go over the budget, uh, the budgeting of the um, all the equipment. If we can just go over exactly, um, you know, on the equipment, can I just go to the website um, that you put in the chat, and that has all the um, lists of all the equipment that I would need to set up an access point? Correct. 
I think the uh, Deborah is saying the forum, the Althea forum has yeah, okay, the got you. most the forum accurate. Has, gotcha. yeah. Okay, cool. Awesome. There's That's also a blog post. Um, Mark is be called um, Start a, or Sustainable Network that has a bill of material. Yeah. Yes, you told me that the other day. Yep. Yeah. So cool. that has, um, that doesn't necessarily go in. It goes into the bill of materials for like a gateway, a relay, and for about 100 subscribers. And so that's all listed on a spreadsheet too. So that might be a good reference to, for the actual like Althea equipment. And then um, Graham's link here has your tools that you're going to need to, to install. Cool. Awesome. And um, let's see. I guess I'll be, yeah, that's, that's all I have for right now. I just need to learn more of, uh, about the, you know, equipment and, um, the sustainable network building materials. I'll take a look at that. Awesome. I, yeah, that'll be it for me. Cool. Right now. Anybody else at B or anybody on the chat? Have questions? You said the, uh, UNMS, um, help control it, or help keep track of inventory, right? Yeah, it can help to keep track of what you have deployed out in the field. Okay. Um, yeah, I guess I'll just have to deep dive because I'm not really seeing anything but net, but uh, monitoring software. Yeah, its primary purpose is monitoring software. So you would be, um, and the way that that works is you tell it what equipment you have where, and then yeah. it, it can reach out and get information from that equipment to tell you how it's performing. So what I'm what I'm proposing is. That that's that primary feature won't actually work gathering the gathering the equipment, but you can still put the equipment in and look back at it and know what you have there. Um, what I'm proposing. So sort of like a fancy spreadsheet, right? Like at um, at Justin's house, I have this this uh, light beam radio, and it's one nine two dot one six eight dot one dot eighty one or something like that, right? Is that right, Graham? And then that's, that's just yeah, kind, of that's kind of what network. I'm putting Does it give you like a network map as well? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, you can you can drop things down on a map so you can see what's where. Um, uh, today, as I understand that the monitoring piece, what wouldn't work, but you just you'd be kind of using it for something other than its main purpose. You, you could use <laughs> but, XYO to track them as well, possibly. Sure. Yeah, th there's quite a lot of products out there, both free and paid, that do some set of these features, and uh, you know we could talk about a lot of different ones, but. Yep. That's that's one. Yeah. Yeah. Any any other questions? Um not till next time. I'm pretty sure I'll have a bunch after <laughs> I get <laughs> <laughs> I do want to cool. thank everybody for being here, especially on a Saturday in the afternoon. I'm um and participating and asking questions. And Graham, thank you very much for your expertise and sharing that with us today. Um appreciate it very much. No hey, problem. Great you, to meet everybody. Uh, I appreciate it, all the information, you. Man, and everybody. You guys are all awesome. This is an yeah. awesome team to be a part of, and <laughs> um, you know it's an honor, as I say. And uh, yeah, I'll have a bunch more questions here after I get done checking out all that stuff. Um, but yeah, that'll be it for me for right now. <laughs>